we are thrilled to welcome our guest right now and to get started. So um, welcome, Jeff. We're thrilled to have you here tonight to tell us all about the Webb Space Telescope and uh, its capabilities, a little bit about the history of it. But first, uh, you know, you can tell us about yourself as well. And uh, welcome. Everybody give him a round of applause. So thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Dr. Reitzel. And thank you also to Patrick and to Chris for that great sort of scientific introduction about about uh, why we're all so excited. And thank you to everybody who's tuning in live tonight on a uh, Friday night. And those of you who might view the, the episode on uh, YouTube over the weekend or later, it's um, it's going to be, hopefully you'll learn a bit and, and we'll uh, entertain you some and you can learn some new things. So yeah, I'll do a, a little bit about uh, myself. So the slide deck mostly comes from the mission itself. So I'll, I'll be lucky enough to use the JWST, hopefully, uh, starting next year. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a Air Force brat. Uh, one of the important postings of my dad was in the Edwards Air Force Base when I was a youngster. And so I learned about technology of flight. And there was a base astronomer there. So I spent you know, most of my life in and around Southern California looking at the sky. And you'll hear some, some great stuff later in the show about the things you'll be able to see uh, in our skies in the coming months. And so stay tuned for that. It's going to be great. I'm also a, a new grandpa, so that's been great. And it really helps motivate me to do events like this to help people learn about, you know, why we love to do astronomy. And I and hope you love to learn about astronomy as well. So um, what my group does at Caltech, I've been there since 1987. We look at the formation of, of stars and planetary systems. And, and one of the things, as I'll tell you, Webb is going to do for us is that we're going to be able to look at objects that are very cold and very dark, where they're not luminous uh, in the optical. So you can see these beautiful young stars, just sort of blue stars and a globular cluster there, NGC 6723. And the dark patch off to the lower left is not empty. It's full of gas and dust that is actively making new stars, but we can't see the process using wavelengths that our eyes are sensitive to. But with things like Webb and other instruments at the radio that we heard about from Patrick, like the ALMA telescope in Chile, we can now make these beautiful images of young stars. And this arrow points to, this is a young star with what's called a circumstellar disk around it, so we'll talk about in a little bit. And that's it. Circumstellar disk is what forms planetary systems. We can image those things now, as I'll show you. And Webb is going to tell us about how the young planets acquire really critical elements like carbon and oxygen that enable the planet to be habitable. So it's a really exciting time for us in astronomy. Uh, as we heard, we've been waiting for Webb for a while. The development cycle started back in 1996. It's been about 25 years since um, we got started on the technology to enable JWST. So let's think a little bit about the telescope itself and the kind of science it's gonna do, and then we'll show you a really neat video at the end um, from the observatory members themselves about the audacious engineering challenges that the deployment of Webb is gonna face. And so as we've heard, Webb is an infrared telescope. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the telescope itself and the science first. Here's a sort of, artist rendition of the deployed telescope with the thermal shield below it and the electronics that talk to Earth on the very bottom there. But here for a sense of scale, right, this is a truly audacious instrument, right? So the, the scale bar here are humans down there in the bottom, right? It's a six and a half meter telescope uh, in diameter. It's gold because gold reflects infrared light very well and has and, and emits very little infrared light if it's cold enough. And so this big telescope is going to let us collect photons from objects at the very edge of the observable universe, for example, for the first time. So you can see how big this is. And the problem is, you know, when we saw the picture of the solar dynamics of observatory, that was also a big uh, telescope, but it was all one monolithic unit, uh, like the Spitzer Space Telescope. Web is so large, it will not be able to fit in even the Ariane 5 fairing without being folded up. And so in this image here, you see, again, for scale, right, still quite large, right? It's, it's you know, a couple people in diameter and much, much longer, but the telescope literally has to be folded up, shipped off to the launch site, and as we'll see in the video, 
when it leaves the earth, it has to be unfolded again uh, to do the science it's designed to do. Let's think a little bit about what that science is, and then we'll get to the video here. So I'll tell you about what we hope Web will do, why the infrared is the right way to do it, and, and give you a few examples, and then we'll show you the, the audacious engineering that has to go in for the mission to work. So what Web is really all about, and what's exciting to us who do astronomy, is that it's about our origins on all scales, both in time and in space. And so we'll look back, as I said, to the very edge of the early universe, the, when galaxies were first assembled, how those galaxies and the black holes inside them grew over time and, and distance. And then in our own galaxy and in, in nearby environments, we're going to be able for the first time with JWST to learn about the chemistry and the growth of compounds and materials that not only create planetary systems, but potentially lead to habitable worlds outside of the Earth. And so we'll give you a quick little um, snapshot into each of those in a minute. But first, why the infrared? And so we heard stars are the fundamental unit of astronomy. Um, stars like the sun uh, emit at wavelengths mostly in the visible, but some into the near infrared. But because of this Dust we talked about very briefly in these, in these beautiful dark clouds. Um, starlight gets absorbed by that dust, just like sunlight gets absorbed by haze in the LA basin. You, see, you know from driving around or walking around on smoggy or, or marine layer days, as the sun sinks towards the horizon, it becomes redder and redder, and that light gets scattered and absorbed by these small particles in the LA basin case in the air. But in astronomy, it's the clouds that see the formation of stars and the formation of planets. And so we can't see through that material in the optical, and so we have to go to longer wavelengths. Um, radio is good, but as we heard, right, as the longer wavelength it is, it's harder to make an image like you can with Hubble without bigger and bigger telescopes. And so JWST kind of splits the middle where it's a short enough wavelength to have beautiful imaging quality and make spectacular images, but also long enough to give us access to these unusual environments and all stages of how stars and planets are put together. And so the infrared is important because it can penetrate these, as we'll see, just to give you a little sense for, you know, an everyday occurrence of visible versus infrared light. Here's a visible light image, like our eyes would see, of meerkats on the left and freshwater crocodile on the right. And in the infrared, what you see, this is on the same scale, so it's about the same size and it's the same scale. And so the meerkats are warm-blooded. They're higher in temperature than the freshwater crocodile on a cool day. And so the infrared gives us information not only about how much stuff is there in astronomy, but how hot or how cold it is. And because cold environments are really important to how we make stars, so I'll show on the next page, right? We really care about being able to see deeply into those environments. So there's a visible light image on the left a near-infrared image, and then a mid-infrared image like JWST will do on the right. And you can see in these beautiful pillars of creation that those dark clouds that, that obscure light from behind them, but we can see through those clouds by going to infrared radiation. And the big challenge for Webb is that we care about these objects that are very, very far away or that are very, very faint and nearby, like exoplanets. And so the job of the James Webb Space Telescope is to capture those infrared photons from objects very far away, or ones that are, are very dim, even locally, and to image them with superb uh, quality, just like the Hubble does. So for example, to show you a, a difference in, in what's gonna happen, if we zoomed in on one of the little um, blobs in a picture like this on large scales, the Spitzer Space Telescope would have seen the blob at left, right? There's this one little blob there. But what JWST will do, like Hubble could do, but now in the infrared, is give us these gorgeous detailed images of galaxies and planets and nearby stars. And so it's going to be an extraordinary advance. Uh, and it's important that it's not just that it's big. It needs to be big to have sharp image quality, but it needs to be cold. And, and that we'll get into in just a minute when we talk about the engineering. So what will Webb do, just real quick, just to run you through. So just like Hubble, here's a, a model taken from Hubble images of very staring very deeply into space. You see all kinds of galaxies, even in, in very dark parts of the sky. And what Webb will do is because 
as light comes from farther and farther away, it's stretched in wavelength. It's called the redshift. That means that optical light back at the dawn of galaxies is shifted into the infrared band where Webb does its work. And so we'll be able to look from right here to left at galaxies just being assembled at the early epochs of the history of the universe to more mature galaxies now that are in the local universe. And we'll be able for the first time to see that complete sequence of assembly of galaxies. And by doing what's called spectroscopy, which we'll get to in just a second, we'll be able to look at whether or not those young galaxies being assembled have active black holes in their centers or not. So it'll be the first time we're gonna be able to watch the coevolution of stars and black holes over cosmic time. Near to us, again, we're going to be able to look at these creation environments where stars and planets are born for the first time. In the solar system, we'll be able to take beautiful images of our own planets at wavelengths that our eyes can't see, and we'll be able to look deeper into the atmospheres, for example, of the gas giants or Uranus and Neptune. Or once it's discovered, we'll be able to take images of planet nine, for example, even hundreds or thousands of times the distance of the Earth to the sun away from us. And finally, on the science side, it's a beautiful image from the Keck telescope on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, where we block the light from the star, and you see these three little dots of light around it. To the right, those are exoplanets orbiting this star at a distance of about 60 or 70 light years from the Earth. Webb will be able to do the same kinds of measurements uh, by blocking the light from stars and image young planets around nearby stars by using what's called the coronagraph. And it's going to be a really exciting capability that was added to the mission, you know, you know, after many years of development of the appropriate instruments on the ground and by the JWST team at NASA and uh, the aerospace companies. And the key thing about this, just to conclude, is that what we do is not just take images. We disperse the light, it's like a rainbow, right? So they have instruments on JWST that disperse the light, like uh, happens in water droplets in a rainbow. And by looking at different colors of light, but now in the infrared, for example, here's the spectrum of the Earth, you can look at the compounds that exist in the atmosphere of this exoplanet and try to understand, does it have liquid water on the surface? Does it have oxygen? Does it have water? And so it's gonna be a really exciting time where we're gonna follow up the beautiful discoveries of Kepler and of TESS and ground-based surveys to actually take spectra of these atmospheres and try and decide if they might be habitable or not. And it's going to be an extremely exciting time uh, for that community, and I'll be involved in that as well, along with the young planets and stars. So just to conclude here with a little bit of the telescope in a, in a movie, the telescope again is audacious. Here's the scale bar again. It's huge. It's six and a half meters again, and it's it can't just be deployed. So you see on the right-hand side, again, the fact that the telescope has to be folded uh, to fit inside the fairing. Here's a scale bar for how big it is compared to Hubble. So the Hubble mirror is at left. The JWST mirror is at right. It's made of these individual hexagon, pan hexagon panels in a honeycomb shape that has to be unfolded to work. It's going to be launched out to a place called the outer Lagrange point. So the Earth and Moon are in the middle of the plot here. Where Webb is going is off to the right, and uh, it'll orbit this, this semi-stable region called the Lagrange point, where it's very easy for it to maintain that stationary position relative to the Earth, talk to the Earth easily, and do uh, the science it's going to do. The key thing for getting cold is you have to block light from the sun. So there's got two sides to the instrument. There's the observing side where the telescope is at left, and that's the cold side. This sun shield, which is layers of mylar, as you can see in the middle there, in between uh, the telescope and the electronics that talk to the Earth, is meant to have a hot side facing the sun and a cold side facing away from the sun. So JDOC will always, the telescope will always be in shadow and in darkness, and that allows it to cool in space down to temperatures of only a few tens of degrees above absolute zero and make it not just a beautiful imaging telescope, but spectacularly sensitive because we're above the Earth's atmosphere, as we heard. This is the science mission now we're going to on par with the, the Apollo missions, Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and Hubble enjoy. missions. For nearly two decades, thousands of people around the world, many have spent their entire careers, built the James Webb Space Telescope. And it all 
comes down to this. Once we launch the James Webb Space Telescope, there are no second chances. We have 300 single point failure items, and they all have to work right. When you're a million miles away from the Earth, you can't send someone to fix it. We've never put a telescope this large in space. We want to see distant parts of the universe humans have never seen before. Looking back in time, almost 14 billion years to see the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. And we want to search for the building blocks of life in the atmospheres of planets orbiting distant stars. To unfold the history of the universe, we must first unfold this telescope. This is the largest primary mirror, the largest sun shield, and the most powerful space telescope ever built. And yet, this large telescope needs to fit inside a 5.4 meter diameter rocket fairing. That's the largest fairing size available on any rocket, and it's the fairing size on our ride to space. The Ariane 5, provided by the European Space Agency, is one of the world's most powerful rockets. To cheat the fairing size limit, we build Webb to fold, like origami, to fit inside the rocket fair. And this brings us to our most challenging part of this mission, unfolding it in space. This, thank God. Think of what you're doing. You're taking this extraordinarily delicate, precise, state-of-the-art scientific instrument, you're slapping it on a rocket, and for the next eight minutes, the explosion from that rocket is following you into outer space. Vibrating you. Shaking you. Everything that goes in outer space has to live through this environment and work once it gets there without having someone come to fix it. Two weeks. That's how long it will take to fully deploy the Webb telescope. We can take longer if we need to, but those two weeks after launch are gonna be nail biters. This is the Mission Operations Center at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Those two weeks after launch will be like our Super Bowl, World Cup, you pick the analogy. Years of training comes down to these moments. The Webb Observatory has 50 major deployments, 50 depending on how you categorize them, and 178 release mechanisms must work to deploy those 50 parts. Every single one of them must work. Unfolding Webb is hands down the most complicated spacecraft activity we've ever done. Then again, nothing about Webb is easy. We've never done any of this before. There's nothing simple about sending anything into space. You can't do it without taking risks. This mission is squarely in new spacecraft territory. Webb is the perfect example of science desire driving engineering capability to new frontiers. Webb's unique design was born from reasoned engineering to accomplish its science goals. Here's the plan. Shortly after launch, we unfold Webb's solar panel for power and our Huygen antenna for communication. About 12 hours later, we have an important engine firing that sends Webb on the proper course towards its orbital destination, about a million miles away. That's where Webb will do its science. Webb will be moving so fast, it passes the moon's orbit in one and a half days, half the time it took Apollo astronauts to reach lunar orbit. First, we lower the sun shield out, then raise Webb's primary mirror and instruments away from the sun shield. The solar wind will push us around with the sunshine open, so we'll unfold a trim tab to help keep us stable. We got these huge, iconic, golded segmented mirrors that will help us deliver amazing new images from the cosmos. But in some ways, the sun shield is a lot more complicated, and it's just as essential. Without it, nothing works. Here we've got five sun shield layers, approximately 8,900 square feet, 
almost the size of three tennis courts, a very thin Kapton material, about one to two thousandths of an inch thick. Making them go where you want them to go in zero G is extremely challenging. The sun shield shades the telescope from the heat of the sun, earth, and moon. The concept is simple, but there is nothing simple about the design or operation, especially when you get to space. Webb's sun shield assembly includes 140 release mechanisms, approximately 70 hinge assemblies, eight deployment motors, bearings, springs, gears, about 400 pulleys, and 90 cables totaling 1,312 feet. All this just to keep the sun shield under control as it unfolds. First, we release these special restraints that protect the sun shield during launch. They roll out of the way, but not all the way until we are ready to deploy a side. Next, we release a set of covers over the core region. Now comes the critical point. All 107 sun shield release mechanisms need to fire on cue. 107. They free the five sun shield layers, allowing them to extend as the mid booms deploy. Sun shield fully deployed, we start setting up the optics. First, the secondary mirror is extended and locked into place. And a special radiator behind web is extended, which helps further lower the temperature of the science instruments. Finally, we open the primary mirror's wings and lock them in place. With that done, web is in its final configuration, but we're not done yet. After 47 deployments, and accomplishing the hardest spacecraft unfolding NASA has ever done, Webb still won't be ready for science. While the instruments cool, we'll control motors behind each of Webb's 18 mirror segments, the secondary mirror, and the fine steering mirror located inside the center of the primary mirror. We'll precisely align the mirror segments to form a perfect mirror. Then, Webb will be ready to explore the cosmos. video gave you a good sense for the, the amazing uh, sequence of events that's going to have to happen fairly soon. So we're going to hear about perseverance and curiosity uh, fairly soon. And right, that's called Seven Minutes of Terror by my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Lab that work on those rovers. They call this 29 days on the edge, as you saw, because it's going to take about 29 days for the telescope to be deployed uh, and become operational for testing. The first images will come back in about three to four months, so if all goes well, um, we'll have the beautiful first release images from Webb by about uh, May of next year. So stay tuned for that, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to Yeah. you for a bit. Yeah, thank you for the, the wonderful presentation and that uh, amazing video there. It was great seeing Amy Lowe. I was at UCLA with her as well. She's uh, She was a lot of fun there, and one of our contacts there at Northrop Grumman. It's an amazing team. Yeah, oh, the team is incredible that, that put the craft together. Um, we were lucky to go visit it and uh, get a quick look at it while it was being built as well a couple of times. And it's just, it's enormous. You know, it's hard to picture how very huge that primary mirror is until you see people out on devices and it was it was it was crazy so i'm everybody's on edge about this and, and worried about the launch we do have some questions i saw um one in our chat that was asking about when it's out at l2 what exactly is it orbiting and one of our staff members said it's actually orbiting the lagrange point itself but why is that why is that a stable place to be and um what is that orbit about it's a it's what's called a quasi stable place if you, if you were exactly at the Lagrange point and you could perfectly stay there and there were no changing forces on you, you would be stable at that point. And so what these all these telescopes are going to do and, and JVC is one of the first is that you will you will orbit around that Lagrange point in the sort of this is what I call this is why it's kind of, you know, 
infinity infinity uh, symbol or figure eight orbits where it takes very little thrust to maintain a stable orbit around the Lagrange point. And so what that means for Webb is that it has to have a very carefully designed sequence of observations, right? The sun shield has to be in the right orientation to shield the telescope. There's only certain parts of the sky you can look at at any given time and maintain that orientation. And because the structure is so huge and it's in space, if you slew it too quickly, it will sit there and just kind of oscillate and not have very good. And so they've had to, so the whole reason that the first call for proposals came out over a year ago was that so the engineers had enough time to plan the sequence of observations so that you could maintain this quasi-stable orbit around the Lagrange point and conduct science observations. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, a, a follow-up from me on that. Um, since one side of the spacecraft is cold, and one side is warm. Will there be any thermal pressure that's put on due to due to the the heat differences? I know asteroids will spin up due to, to effects like that. So depending on the orientation, of the flight winds because in the slight different orientations, right? The, the the shield will not actually be the same distribution of temperatures across the entire three tennis courts of the back. They have there's very fine guidance sensors that look at stars on the spacecraft and actually have to use a little bit of the fuel to make sure that the telescopes point exactly where it's supposed to. So yeah, we'll have to adjust to the fact that there's changing solar insulation, there's changing attitude. And so, yep, it's gonna have, fortunately it's, you know, it's so efficient at L2, um, a very modest amount of fuel compared to example, what spits are used will last the telescope for three to four decades. So fuel is not the main limitation. You, you just touched on a, a point there. You said three to four decades. Uh, how long is the projected lifetime of the uh, JWST? The, it's called the phase one or level one mission requirement is five years. But mm -hmm. unlike the Spitzer Space Telescope there, right? So the Spitzer Space Telescope and IRS before it. So again, thank you to Patrick and Chris for that nice introduction. They carry what's called liquid helium. So it's helium atoms that are cooled to about 4.2 degrees above absolute zero. And as they boil off, right, they that cool the telescope and the instruments. But once the helium was boiled off, then spits are warmed up. So on web, we actually use little mechanical coolers that do that for us. And so there's no cryogens to run out, but these are active coolers. They're right, they're yeah, and so if those fail, then the, then the telescope will begin to warm. It'll be colder than Spitzer was because of the sun shield, but it will still, there'll be certain capabilities that will be lost. And so I suspect, you know, perhaps like Spitzer, right, the, the longer wavelength instruments will probably go first, and then the shorter wavelength instruments, because remember, I didn't say it, but the Webb telescope actually works down to near optical wavelengths. And so those, those instruments don't need to be so actively cooled as, as the long wavelengths would do. So. So it could another, be another quite a bit longer than the five years. We just don't know yeah, how long. Hopefully. We hope so. We hope it's going to be like those wonderful, you know, rovers on Mars and go way past the mission lifetime, like uh, Spirit and Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We really are. Um, some folks were wanting to know what the Lagrange point really is. And a simple answer is um, it's further away from the Earth is the one they're going to. So you would think right. an object there would take longer to orbit the sun but you need to add in the Earth's gravity as well. So the sun's gravity Correct. plus the Earth's gravity create enough tug to accelerate the spacecraft out there at the same rate to go around the sun in one Earth year. So it's kind of a balance point out there. There's also one interior where the Earth's gravity mm -hmm. is subtracting the extra gravity because you're too close to the sun. So you'll orbit the same rate. And there's one ahead of our orbit and one behind our orbit. Those are the, the four well-known Lagrange points. In fact, we think there are asteroids clustered at the L2 That's and L3, right. um, forward and backward in our orbits, and we've only found a couple of them because it's really hard to find them around Earth. Jupiter you has found them around Jupiter. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's, that's where, another that's where, that's where Lucy is going. Yeah, the Lucy exactly. is going right there. You're and, about Lucy coming up. Yeah, Chris will tell you a little bit more about that launch. And, and how that the uh, Genesis spacecraft was at the interior Lagrange point and collected solar wind particles to learn about the composition of the sun. That was another great mission that was astronomy related, but, you know, collected actual samples. 
Yeah, we've got a great question here. Wanting to know if the web will be able to see the bands of the atmosphere of gas giant planets. So first of all, on our own solar system, will it be able to see that? And then will it be able to tell us anything about bands of clouds in exo gas giants, gas giants around other stars? Another excellent question. So yeah, web is big enough that it'll take spectacular images of the planets in our own solar system. But they're wavelengths that are hard to do from the ground. And we'll let us see, for example, in Jupiter, you can see deep into the where the water clouds are for the first time with, with these wavelengths. This will give us a whole new way to track dynamics on storms and, and circulation patterns, which we'll hear more about from Patrick in the, the J Jupiter segment mm -hmm. of the show. And for exoplanets, we don't actually resolve them, but what we do is, right, the exoplanets will spin just like the planets in our solar system do. And if you look at those planets over time, the light that's emitted by those planets varies slightly as the different cloud bands come into view or come out of view. And so by doing what's called time domain astronomy, then we can begin to learn about, you know, what the cloud cover is. And then by doing this, again, dispersing of the light into a rainbow, we can learn about what the clouds are made of in those bands. And so the combination of doing spectra on those objects and doing watching them change over time will tell us about weather on not just exoplanets but, but stars brown dwarfs things like that so it'll be a really important thing that what we'll do and where we really hope the mission lifetime will as we heard greatly exceed 10 years so we have enough time to watch these things change and learn more about the the objects yeah it'd be fantastic to know more about them um another question do we have a target for those first images do you know what the first images will be they yeah, have been selected, that. but they have not been released. <laughs> One of my former students, Alex, Dr. Alexander Lockwood, is the chief uh, communication scientist for for JWC, and the and these early release you know, images have the objects have been chosen, but they have not been revealed yet. Well, this this sounds like the sleuths out there need to get going because we have <laughs> we probably do. <laughs> We know what time of year it's launching. We know where it's going. We know that the sunshade has to be facing the sun. So there's sort of a band that you can observe that time of year. So we ought to go see what's in this band. How long is it going to take to deploy everything? 29 days to get it out there. And then the first observation shortly <laughs> after that. So about a month after launch, let's figure out where we are. We'll figure out what band is in there. And maybe Andromeda's right dead center in the, that band. And we'll know that's the target. Well, uh, do I do you know have a favorite? Do you I know they tried if, to pick if one you were picking images. So they've, you know, I, I, you know, I study young stars and planets. So I, you know, I know, I'm sure that one of these young stellar nurseries will be one of them, yeah. uh, like the Pillars of Creation. And I'm sure there'll be an interesting galaxy out there, you know, and there'll probably be something from the solar system as well. So we'll see. They really want to showcase all the different. So it's not just the. I should have said right. There's not just one instrument on JWST. There's a near infrared camera and and optical camera it can do spectra of many objects at the same time and there's a mid infrared spectrometer and camera and both of these have these uh what are called coronagraphs that block the light from bright objects to look for dim things and so they're gonna they're gonna exercise all the modes of the telescope and demonstrate to the public and to the scientific community that all the modes are working and show just you know what um, only That'll be these spectacular images. So, yeah. Well, will there be any really deep sky images taken, like the deep fields that Hubble took? That's another question. From Maybe not right away for those, but what they also have are early science observations, early release science, and those. Uh, so usually, when these telescopes work, is it you get a you get a propose, you get your observations, you get to work on them for a little while before they become public. But for the early release science, those results will be released to the entire scientific community and the public immediately upon processing and those will have very deep images uh, and very large scale images and so those will be I guess the ones that people are really waiting for these early demonstration observations are short but the early release science is going to be spectacular and we'll all get access to it at the same time and and the race will be on yeah so get uh, get those grad students and postdocs ready to start doing analysis and get those papers written and then Patrick you'll need a whole team of people to probably Make some just beautiful. Say, but it, it's all out there, so I'm really hoping that people will combine, you know, web observations with optical images and just make some spectacular uh, data sets for us all to enjoy. 
Yeah. Would, would there be a uh, a public outreach uh, site where where you would post these images as they come in, and, and yes, people so can. Yes. So the early the early response will have the raw will have the raw data from the scientists, but then also process images through the pipelines that are available to the public for easier easier use and consumption. So. Yeah, that'll be fantastic. Now, um, somebody in our, our chat also wanted to know, will there be any cameras watching the web unfold during those 29 days? What will be the indications? We know things are going well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't believe there are cameras on this, so it won't be quite like the, you know, the Mars efforts <laughs> where we get, had these very spectacular images of robots taking pictures of robots in the whole descent. It's just uh, astonishing to watch that happen. So this will be a much quieter and more deliberate process where it'll be telemetry from the spacecraft telling us when things are working well. Yeah, I know they decided not to send any CubeSats or anything like that along to observe. A little too dangerous. You don't want to have a CubeSat go awry when you've got a telescope of this value going up. Um, Correct. Here, um, people are hoping we look at Sagittarius A star. Um, sure, that will happen. Yeah. <laughs> <Some point. laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm I'm very much looking forward to a lot of the exoplanet observations that are going to be made possible with Webb, um, characterizing some of the nearby uh, exoplanets that are in the habitable zone, being able to see it, is there any sign of say water vapor, are there clouds? Is there an ocean? And then starting to ask the bigger questions of, well, methane, you need to reproduce it. Sure, you can do it with volcanoes, but if you also see oxygen, you also see some of these secondary indicators, you start to build a case that says, maybe something really interesting is going on here. Um, yep. And you know, Webb may answer these questions to more detail than we think. As people get the instruments and they get the telescopes in their hands, we always think of new ways to use them. So we have all these ideas now, what Webb will do. Just that was wait. the real lesson of Spitzer, right? Yeah. Spitzer was not designed to do exoplanet science and it spent, you know, some large fraction of the warm mission doing spectacular exoplanet science. And so you're exactly right. You know, people are extremely creative and, uh, you know, I just can't wait to see what this, what we all do with, with the yeah. telescope. Now, the, the latest on the launch is still no earlier than, than the 22nd of December. Um, the last I heard, the, the, the reason that was pushed back a little bit from the 18th is there was a vibration in a, in a bracket that held it to the, the vehicle. It came loose somehow. They, yes. they were a little worried, but not too worried because remember, Webb went through acoustic testing. It was put in a chamber and they sent loud sound yeah. waves through it, making the whole thing vibrate and shake to simulate launch. It was also put on a platform and shook to, to, to simulate launch. So a, a strap coming loose, although not ideal, it also was not the biggest vibration that the, the craft had suffered. And they, they believe everything is fine. They put it through what paces they could. They've te checked what systems they can and everything seems to check out. So. We're on schedule to launch on the 22nd. So stay tuned, everybody. It's coming right up. And uh, oh, yeah. any final questions from you, Chris or Patrick, or from our audience out in the YouTube land? I'll take a look here. Um, I'm not seeing any. So again, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. I very much Absolutely. appreciate it. It was, thank it was you fantastic. So much. Yeah. And you know, thank maybe the invitation. I, I love being here. Yeah. Well, uh, next time, um, hopefully, you'll be able to join us in person. Uh, sooner or later, this pandemic will end and Griffith Observatory will be able to have folks in person. And we'd love to have you come join us in the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater in person, get to see our audience in person. It, it's These are fun to do and we'll keep streaming always. I don't think we're going to have a day we won't stream these any longer, but there is something nice about being at Griffith Observatory. It's a very special place and we'd love to have you there. One of my favorite places in all of LA. Well, thank you for saying so. And again, wonderful segment tonight. Everybody, let's uh, stay tuned. Keep the cat off my keyboard here. Um, stay tuned for that launch. So thanks so much.